Hi everyone, uh, this is Bezat Hashim and this is Hashim's Economics. And today we have a great guest. Um, uh, our guest today is uh, Ambassador Macpol. Uh, welcome, Ambassador Macpol. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, let me introduce you to our audience. Uh, uh, Ambassador Macpol is a professor at the uh, Department of Political Science at Stanford, and he's also a director at the Freeman Spaulding Institute um, for International uh, for International Studies. Uh, he's also a, a, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, he's both an academic and uh, a, a person who is deeply involved in policy. Uh, he served for five years at the Obama administration, at the National Security Council, the White House, and as an ambassador to the Russian Federation. He regularly, he regularly writes uh, op-eds uh, for Washington Post. Uh, and today, uh, he, uh, he wrote the... Uh, 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 co-authored uh, op-ed on Ukraine. Uh, just, I just read it actually. Uh, so uh, let me ask you about the, the most sort of uh, important topic of today. This is December 1, 2021. Uh, what's going on in, in, in the border of Ukraine and, uh, and what should, should, should we worry about? Well, first, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, uh, I used to work on Central Asia too when I was at the National Security Council, but that was a long time ago. Um, but you're from uh, Tashkent, or where are you from originally? Yeah, so I'm from Tashkent, yes. So one of the greatest cities in the world. I've been to Tashkent many times. Uh, first visited in 1992, and um, I'm finally getting back to Uzbekistan this spring uh, with a group from Stanford. So after I get back, we'll have to have a longer conversation about uh, politics in Central Asia. Uh, but we'll talk about whatever you want now. With respect to the border, um, you know, uh, to remind your listeners, this is the second big buildup that Mr. Putin has done on the Ukrainian border this year. Uh, this one is qualitatively and quantitatively bigger from what I read and what my colleagues in the government, the, the American, the U.S. government, but also friends of mine in Ukraine say. Um, uh, Mr. Putin uh, has been obsessed with Ukraine for a long, long time. Um, he doesn't consider Ukraine a truly sovereign country or a truly independent nation from uh, Russia. Um, and he used to say that, you know, behind closed doors. Um, uh, now he says it rather openly and he's even published a long article I was just looking at um, um, called on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. It's a it's like a 10,000 piece word, by the way, uh, like uh, obviously somebody wrote it for him. But, um, you know, he's had this view for a long time and um, increasingly he has, I think, uh, escalated in his rhetoric, the threats to Ukrainian sovereignty. And um, I think I don't think I know that the, um, the Biden administration is very worried about this. Uh, there was recently just a, a NATO ministerial in Riga, I think it ended yesterday, where this was the main focus of attention, and most certainly in Kiev, it's a focus of attention. Um, I want to say very clearly that I do not know what Putin's true intentions are. Uh, you know, I've known Putin for a long time. We met first in 1991. Uh, I've written about him for many, many years as an academic, and then for the five years I served in government, uh, I interacted with him uh, when he met with uh, usually my bosses, uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden, um, Secretary Kerry. Um, uh, so, but I want to be clear, uh, I've not, I know a lot about Putin, but I don't know what his true intentions are. And I don't believe anybody uh, knows what his true intentions are. And I think that's important to understand, but because that's part of what Putin wants. Putin likes it when all of us are thinking about what he's doing. Uh, he likes uh, to keep us on our toes. He likes to uh, do unpredictable things uh, and then see how we respond. Um, and I think that's the situation we're in right now. He's formally said some things about not wanting Ukraine to join NATO and, and others in the Russian press have said uh, they're doing this because they're worried that that Kiev, the government in Kiev, is planning to take by force Donbass, that's an eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, that, of course, is nonsense. There's no plans that I know of to, to do that. Um, but, you know, he's, he's being coercive and he's seeing what he can get in return 
from these coercive actions. I see. Uh, so I, I think you've, uh, you, you wrote about Putin uh, for, for a very long time. I think you know how he thinks. But what explains uh, his um, obsession with, uh, with, the, with the borders of Russia and, and Ukraine, for that matter? And why do you think he wants to act unpredictably? Is it, is it part of the character or is it like a grand strategy of foreign relations that he has? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, to, you know, in my un interactions with him and studying him, I do think there is a misconception uh, in my country, uh, probably not in Uzbekistan, by the way, because Uzbekistan's had a lot more uh, close personal contact with Mr. Putin. Um, but there's a misconception that, that he's just a transactional leader. He's a realist. Um, you know, he doesn't really have an ideology. That's what many analysts argue. And I think that's categorically wrong. Um, now, I think it's also important to say, before I go on, Putin's ideas have evolved over time. Uh, they, they, were, they are not the same today as they were in 1991 or, or 2000 when he became president. They've changed over time. And, I'm, and we can talk about that later if you're interested. But today, um, uh, there are a couple of key uh, concepts, ideological concepts, analytic frameworks that he has that I think drives his behavior abroad. Number one, um, he believes that the West and the United States in particular, uh, and when I was ambassador in Moscow, me personally, are out to weaken Russia and to overthrow his regime. He genuinely believes that. It's not true. Uh, you know, that most certainly was not true when I worked in the government, but he genuinely has this fear of the West. Um, that's number one. Number two, he fundamentally frames um, uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the United States in zero-sum terms. So if it's plus two for Russia, it's minus two for the United States and vice versa. Uh, other leaders in Moscow, including Medvedev, including Gorbachev, including Yeltsin, uh, did not frame the world in zero-sum terms. They thought that there could be good things for Russia and good things from the United States from cooperation, plus two for America, plus two for Russia at the same time. But Putin, Putin sees the world in zero-sum ter terms. Third, he believes that um, there's something unique about Russian culture and Russian history uh, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a conservative, orthodox set of values. And he believes that he is the protector of those values uh, that are being attacked and, and, and undermined by liberal decadent values from Europe and the United States. And so that's the ideological part, right, where he really does believe that there, there are these innate cultural values that that go back a thousand years you know to uh, to rus uh, and that gets to this kiev thing i'll get to in a minute and and the west and our liberal ideas are, are are attacking those russian ideas and so he wants to defend them um you know in the first 10 years of, of his time in power he was defending those ideas mostly within russia but today he now seeks to find ideological allies uh, outside of Russia. And, and by the way, I think he's had some success with that. There are, there are other people that, that share those, those values with him. Uh, Mr. Orban in Hungary, uh, Salvini in Italy, Le Pen in France. Um, and I would even see uh, former President Trump here in my country, uh, where there was a kind of ideological affinity about conservative orthodox values, anti-liberalism, anti-multilateralism, and that's an, another that's another part of uh, the, the way it shapes his views, and then the last piece to that must be added this 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 particular obsession with um, uniting the Slavic peoples, right? Uh, he thinks it's an artificial barrier between Ukrainian people and Russian people, Belarusian people and Russian people. That, that came about as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. But I think he sees it as part of his mission to try to bring together that, that, that Slavic nation um, and therefore 
you know, uh, an independent Ukraine uh, threatens that. And then the last piece I, I would say to that, it's related, but it's, it's worth underscoring. Um, you know, in Putin's worldview, uh, the, the state, the Russian state, is he wouldn't use this words, these are now my words. He would say, we need a strong state, uh, but, but what that translates into is an autocratic state. Uh, you know, uh, so a czar, a czar, a voj, uh, you know, the, the, a, a kind of paternalistic leader that can lead the rest of the nation, right? Um, and, and he believes that's connected to old Russian history. It goes way back. And by the way, there's some evidence that supports that. Most of Russian history, they've been ruled by autocrats, not Democrats. Um, but, but Ukraine- For all the countries in the world, right? Like uh, 3,000 years ago, whatever, like no, there was no democracy. That's right. And, and, and that's a very good point, by the way, that, that most countries for most of their history have not been ruled by democratic institutions uh, and, and elected by the people, but, but the power came from God or it came from a communist party, or, but it didn't come from the people. So uh, the, the experiment with democracy is just a few hundred years old compared to this, this longer standing tradition. And, and by the way, maybe he's right. I don't know if he's right. Uh, maybe maybe this, this experiment with democracy will fade away and we'll go back to an old period. I, I don't happen to believe that and I most certainly don't want that, but it's a hypothesis about history. I, I don't want to pre pretend I know, but the, 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 because he has that view, a democratic Ukraine is a threat to his ideology because if these Slavic people that he considers just like Ru to be Russians can govern themselves democratically, then that undermines his argument about why there should be autocracy in Russia. And that, I think you put all those things together, that, that helps to explain his, his obsession with democratic Ukraine today. Now, let me point out something that you've uh, mentioned uh, about zero sum games. I mean, um, Zero-sum games are defined usually in game theory in which it's a sort of transaction in which uh, if somebody's winning, somebody must be losing. Right. And I, uh, in my writing and, you know, experience and so on, I, I also realized it's very common ideology among, you know, military people and so on and so on, which is much rarer in, uh, among, among people who are like traders or entrepreneurs or something. Right. We understand fundamentally that if somebody is sort of winning a deal or something, it doesn't mean that the other side should sort of lose. And yes, in countries too. I mean, within within the United States, you can you can see people who think the world is a zero sum game, and, and some people are not. Like, what do you think explains you know sort of fundamentally why some people view the world in, in zero sum and some people don't? Not put in particularly, but overall, like, what's your theory of zero sum games? Well, that's a great question. It's a really big philosophical question. Um, uh, uh, you know that. You know, you're, you you probably know the history in terms of economic theory a lot better than I do. Uh, I I do think uh, it it does depend on the domain space, and it does or the sector, um, and and not some competitions are zero sum. Uh, not all can be uh, solved by win win outcomes. Um, but but I also believe that it's very dangerous for either countries or companies or individual individuals to frame everything in zero sum terms, because I think that makes the world uh, worse off. Uh, I, so I strongly believe philosophically, I'm liberal that way, right? I believe that, that uh, trade makes, uh, as long as it's willful trade and not coercive trade, uh, but if I have a talent uh, or I have a product and you want to, you, you don't have it, and, but you want to give me something of value in return, we're both been, been, met, been better off by that transaction. That's number one. Number two, there are certain kind of just basic coordination games, uh, and I'm not, I don't want to use economic uh, slang. Uh, there are certain kinds of coordination that if we don't do, we're both worse off. Right. We, we both lose. And, you know, the classic example, of course, in academia is we all got to decide on what side of the road we're going to drive on. Uh, and that's not an ideological thing. That's just a very 
uh, transactional thing so that we don't kill each other when we're on the road, right? Well, that's a rule uh, that makes us better off. And, and so uh, that's another kind of basic coordination that makes individuals better off. And, but I think there are applications of that to countries too. Like, like we all lose if the planet burns. Uh, and if we, if we don't have a way to control climate change, it doesn't matter if you live in Uzbekistan, Russia, America, or China, we, we all will eventually lose from that. And then there's, a, there's higher forms of cooperation where, where in the marketplace and in politics, um, you know, long-term iterative um, win-win outcomes leads to a world that, that we're all better off in. Um, and, you know, when I worked for President Obama, uh, he most certainly believed that, um, and he thought that that even sometimes you had to forego short-term short wins for these long-term uh, gains that were more cooperative. Um, but Putin, you know, listening to him talk, I think he was suspicious of that, and he was suspicious of it because he thought that that the the multilateral institutions that we wanted them to cooperate in. I was part of, for instance, to make it less abstract, I was part of the negotiations to get Russia into the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. and, and our argument to them is, you get into the WTO, that'll be good for the Russian economy, and it'll be good for our economy. Um, Putin looks at, at organizations like the WTO and he thinks, oh no, that's just an institution that expands American hegemonic power uh, and imperial power. Um, and, and therefore he was much more suspicious of those kinds of organizations. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for that um, uh, info about WTO, because Uzbekistan is one of the few, like I think the only um, country uh, with Turkmenistan that didn't join WTO. Yes. Um, so I, I'm I remember that. rooting for that Uzbekistan will join. On August uh, 23 in your op-ed, uh, you mentioned that, and I quote, in the global struggle between democracy and dictatorship, and the fight for a peaceful Europe, Ukraine is on the front lines. So do you think that your this statement is, is almost exactly what, what sort of Putin thinks as well? Like yes. Ukraine is the place where basically the, the fate of the world is, 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 is being um, debated, if you will? Uh, well, without question it is in Europe and, and I think it has implications for around the world, uh, but that's a great question. And my answer is absolutely yes, that he does think that this is the frontline state and he wants to win. Um, and he understands uh, from his, in, you know, with his analytic framework that it, if Ukrainian democracy fails, that will be a giant victory for autocratic leaders like himself and, and especially in, you know, the space that he's working in. Um, and by the way, you know, um, Ukrainians understand that, um, and, but also, you know, I'll call them small D Democrats uh, in Georgia and Moldova and Belarus. They also understand that, that if Ukraine falls, it will weaken their struggles for uh, democratic features. So um, why do you think the democratic ideas around the world, including Russia and China and, and even the US for that matter, or, or Central Europe, for example, Turkey and, and so on and so forth, I can go on. The, 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 again, the, the small d democratic ideas are not as popular as they were, say, 18 years ago or 15 years ago, even. Right. And, you know, what's going on? What's, what's, what's up with this uh, unpopularity of democratic ideas? Well, um, big, hard question. And uh, I think it's a, it's a conflation of a, a variety of factors, right? There's just not a monocausal uh, explanation. Um, but, uh, but three things are at the top of the list. So first, we had this massive wave uh, called the third wave of democratization, uh, started in Portugal in 1974. And anytime you have a big wave of democracy, uh, the first two waves, there's always a rollback, right? Because some, some be countries become democratic states and they don't consolidate. And that, so that's happening all over the world. Um, uh, number two, um, uh, and and another, another thing I would add to that, this wave was so big that it, it, you had democratic 
experiments in a lot of lower income and middle income countries. Uh, and those are places where it's the hardest to consolidate democracy. So, you know, as you know well, as an economist, there's a, in political science, we talk a lot about modernization. Um, I think modernization, which is the more well-to-do a society is, the more likely it is to be democratic. Um, I think over the long stretch of history, that, that still holds true. And I, I associate that theory with my former colleague here, Marty Lipset, uh, who used to teach here at Stanford with me. Um, modernization doesn't predict breakthroughs, though. Um, breakthroughs happen for a variety of reasons, right? Breakdown of empires, wars, economic uh, collapses. Um, um, so, so you had a lot of those breakthroughs. And I think, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union was one of the biggest ones, of course. Um, you had this wave of new democracies, but they happen in, in places where the, uh, the, the permissive conditions for democratic consolidation were weaker than say Portugal or Spain back in the 70s. Um, uh, so that was one thing. Second thing, you've had a crisis within the old democracies that you alluded to, right? So uh, in my country, but, but in many of the old established liberal democracies, they haven't been delivering in terms of economic growth. Uh, that has to do with globalization and the, you know, the export of manufacturing jobs that, that came with that. Um, and so that, that's a problem. And then add to that the, the rise of, of some powerful autocracies, uh, China being the most important one, but also Russia. And so, you know, if you have a rising autocracies as you're in your neighborhood, that creates difficulties for consolidating democracy. So you put all those three things together, I think that's why we're in, you know, we're now I think in the 16th year of democratic decline. Having said all that though, I wanna be clear, I'm a huge optimist about democracy in the long term. I, I am not in the camp that thinks that, you know, that this is the beginning of the end um, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, I think, you know, democracy is a horrible system of government, uh, except compared to all the rest, as Winston Churchill said very famously. And, and I think in terms of delivery of things that people want, uh, democracies, I still think outperform autocracies across a range of issues, not just economic, but across a range of issues. Um, and number two, uh, if you look at public opinion polling around the world, uh, democracies has fallen, that's true, but, but not that radically. Um, uh, uh, there is not a giant demand for, you know, communist party dictatorship uh, around the world. Uh, you don't see that in a public opinion polling at all. And, and even on the, on the mobilization part, like, you know, let me pause for a minute, but I can't think of a massive social movement in the last 30 years where people went on onto the streets and they said, give me communist party dictatorship. I want communist party dictatorship. Uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're in this lull, but I don't think it'll last forever. I see. So, um, and th that question is related to your recent uh, essay in uh, American Purpose, in which you call uh, to create uh, some sort of an institution that you call International Platform for Freedom or of Freedom um, that would help uh, promote democratic ideas, both through you know, education and, and so on and so forth. Uh, how do you think the US has to handle its uh, unique role as uh, the largest and richest democratic country in the world? Do you think that Americans have to you know, invest more in that? Or do you think that, um, you know, things that happened in you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and so on, where people say it was the, the promotion of democracy sort of failed and that's why we shouldn't do it. Like, where, where do you see yourself in that? Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing I, I would say is, um, first let's focus on why and then the what, right? So why should Americans care about democracy? In the world. I mean, in the world. Um, uh, I think there are, there are three big reasons. Um, uh, a moral reason, as I, I, I hinted at, right? It's a better system of government. And if you're a moral person, 
then you should want uh, that kind of uh, system of government for others. That's the moral reason. Uh, second, let's say you're a completely immoral person and you don't care about you know how people in Uzbekistan live or uh, anywhere. You just don't care. Um, I think if you look at the long stretch of American history, um, uh, we have benefited from um, more security and more prosperity as a result of more democracy in the world. Uh, so just from a you know interest-based argument, uh, you should we should want more democracy. So think on the security side. Um, there are there may be a few exceptions depending on how you code countries, right? But I would argue, um, thinking about our history, every serious enemy of the United States, uh, including ones that we've had gone to war with from time to time, has been an autocracy. Never have we been threatened by a democracy. Uh, not, that's argument number one. Number two, um, uh, if you think about when we've had to go to war, either Cold War or Hot War, um, our closest allies have always been democracies. Enduring alliances have always been with the democracies. Now, we've had some autocratic uh, allies from time to time. Um, and, you know, whether we needed them or not is a very important historical argument. Uh, I actually once wrote an article back in 2005 about uh, the former president of, of Uzbekistan. Uh, when we did a deal with Mr. Karimov uh, to set up a base there, and, and I wrote this article called The False Promise of Autocratic Stability. And, and, the, the, and I was writing about Uzbekistan, but I was writing about other countries. I said, there are two problems with autocratic allies. Number one, they can change their mind in a heartbeat. And so, uh, you know, in, in November, they're your ally, in December, they're not. Uh, and that happened with us in Uzbekistan uh, because of what happened in, in Uzbekistan and, and, and Andijan, Andijan in 2005, if I'm remembering right. He just flipped on us on a dime. Uh, democracies can't do that. Uh, they're, they're, they're have to, they, it's harder for them just to, to abandon their alliances. And number two, uh, another problem with autocratic allies is they get overthrown. Uh, you know, democratic allies don't get overthrown in revolutions. And, and here, the, the case I, I like to talk about is the Shah of Iran. He was a great ally for America, fantastic ally for 39 years. 39 years, he was there for us. But that 40th year, or maybe it was 38 years and then the 39th year, I'm not remembering. But that, that, that year that he fell, he created this giant problem for us. Uh, that we are still living with in terms of American security because of the, the Iranian revolution. Revolutions don't happen against democratic uh, consolidated democracy. So, so, you know, we have had these uh, autocratic allies from time to time, but, but they're not reliable. And then the third thing I would say, um, the transition from autocracy to democracy, right, also enhances our security. So who are some of our closest allies today? They're countries that did make that flip. Germany, Japan, Italy, all of those countries flipped. Now they're our allies. And I would say the same about Poland, right? Poland's a great ally of ours. Estonia is a great ally of ours. They went to war with us in other places because they flip from dictatorships to uh, democracies. And then finally, we don't have time to get into it in, in detail, but the expansion of the democratic world also led to the expansion of economic opportunity for American companies and therefore American individuals, right? The collapse of communism was good for the American economy, uh, you know? Boeing sells planes now to former communist countries that they didn't before. Um, you know, people debate how to measure that, but, but ec economic prosperity and opportunity uh, oftentimes follows after democratic transitions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, you, you, your point about the, the overthrowing is there's a funny Russian joke about it that, you know, in democracies, um, people vote every four years and in autocracies, they vote every day. I mean, <laughs> 
something like that. Anyway, yeah, that's good. Uh, so uh, let me finish up uh, with uh, with the last question uh, for today. Uh, last year, in December of last year, uh, when we were actually like scheduling uh, this, uh, I saw you on Twitter writing the next year, meaning 2021, you would want to spend a learning about Uzbekistan. So can you share uh, what you have learned so far and you know where you're at, at at your learning process? Yeah, so I'm not as far along as I want to be because uh, I have these day jobs that get in the way. Um, but but I, I'm writing a, a book right now about great power competition in the 21st century, right? So it's China, the US, Russia, uh, and I wanna learn lessons from the Cold War uh, again, you know, writing mostly for an American audience, and I want to I want to make sure we learn the good, the the smart things we did in the Cold War that helped us prevail, uh, and I also want us to learn the 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 negative lessons from the Cold War so that, that we don't repeat them again in the 21st century. And I think there are both there are positive lessons and negative lessons that we have to learn. Um, um, in writing this book. Uh, a, a major area of competition between Russia, China, and the United States is Central Asia. Uh, I, and I think uh, there are some very powerful things that we can learn by understanding better how that competition is playing out uh, in that uh, part of the world. Um, and and uh, related to many of these things that we've just been talking about, right? Democracies, autocracies, trade, uh, the way China does things versus Russia, coercion versus win-win outcomes. And, and, and I want to say, uh, invite me back, because uh, I, I hope to make a major trip in the spring to Central Asia uh, to do some field work. Um, uh, but my working assumption right now is um, the United States uh, needs to avoid framing our competition in Central Asia strictly in terms of zero sum competition, uh, because I think that's dangerous. Uh, I think it's dangerous for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't think it's true. Um, you know, I just learned recently a really fascinating example. Um, uh, the, 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 the serving uh, ambassador uh, to the United States from Uzbekistan was just here at Stanford last week or two weeks ago. Uh, and he told me about this amazing uh, story, and then I looked it up, and I was shocked by it. But Uzbekistan just recently made a purchase, I want to say $300 million purchase from Boeing uh, of some Dreamliners, right? Uh, so that's got to be good for Uzbekistan. I think it's for Uzbek Air. Um, uh, I know it's good for Boeing, and, I, and Boeing is a company that employs a lot of Americans, so it's good for the American workers, too, in my opinion. Um, uh, but here's a, here's a fascinating piece of that story uh, in terms of win-win outcomes. Uh, number one, there are lots of components in the Dreamliner that are that rely on Russia, um, um, and and my I'm out of date, so I'll be careful here. But but you know, Boeing has a giant partnership with several companies in Russia that provide component parts to the Dreamliner. So that purchase is not just good for Boeing, it's also good for their partners in Russia. Uh, but the most amazing part that I learned uh, is that the financing for that purchase came from a Chinese bank, yep. not from an American bank, mm -hmm. um, uh, because they had they gave better terms than what they, the uh, American XM bank did. Now, I think American XM should give better terms to Uzbekistan, but like think about how interesting that story is, right? Um, lots of people are benefiting. And if we, if we had a policy in the United States that said Boeing cannot take financing from Russian banks or Chinese banks, uh, that makes Uzbekistan worse off, that makes China worse off, and that makes the United States worse off. So that's an example of win-win, of, of, uh, but there are other sectors I wanna be clear that are much more zero sum uh, and that where um, I believe the United States has to reinvigorate their engagement with Uzbekistan, with Kazakhstan, with Tajikistan, uh, so that we can help balance against, you know, what I would say are more coercive players uh, in that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, 
Central Asia has got a pretty tough neighborhood. Uh, and so uh, to have more players in that neighborhood to provide more options, I think makes the societies of, of Central Asia better off. And I think it makes America better off. Well, what's your uh, most favorite uh, Uzbek restaurant in Moscow and then what, what you liked about it? So I'm going to forget the names because it's been so long. Because so I've, I've uh, been, you know, figured it out. I was, uh, as you know, I, I, I tragically am on the Putin sanctions list. So I, I cannot travel to Russia these days. But I want you to know this. Um, uh, you know, I was a U.S. ambassador for a couple of years. I was there with my wife and my two sons. And, um, you know, we had a fabulous chefs that worked for us at Spasso House and, uh, you know, that worked, you know, we didn't have to go anywhere to have fantastic food. But whenever we went out to restaurants, um, uh, my wife uh, and I uh, had a fondness for Georgian food. Um, and we still do. In fact, I'm going to have Georgian food tomorrow night. Now that I think about it at our house. But my two sons. Um, they were, they were fanatics about Uzbek food. Uh, and so anytime there was a chance for them to vote where to go, it was always Uzbek. Um, and there, there was one place on, um, Novi Arbat in particular, and I won't remember the name of it. I can see it in my head. I'm going to look it up and I'm going to email you it, but it was only about 10 minutes from our house. Um, and, uh, that was their favorite place because uh, they love shashlik. They're big meat guys. Um, and uh, uh, whenever they got to vote, it was always Uzbek. So we went to that one. And there was another one over by um, Chisti Prudi. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it. But that was another one. That was farther away from where we lived. Uh, but, but we spent a lot of time eating Uzbek uh, food uh, when we lived in Russia. But don't tell the Russians I said that. We love their uh, we love Russian food too. But my sons had a uh, particular um, uh, obsession with Uzbek food when we lived in Moscow. Yeah, Uzbek food is is I think very very popular, like Georgian in in, in Moscow, Russia. So thank you um, for your uh, time. Uh, and um, again, so I take your uh, invite. So I'm going to invite you uh, on spring after your trip to Uzbekistan. Or maybe fantastic. That'd be great. Yeah, and so uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for your time.